Welcome back for the last uh, session of this um, commemoration of CP1 here at Argonne. Uh, before we start, I thought I would introduce panel members. I, some of them have already spoken today and been introduced, but I thought I would do a quick, a quick run. Right here to, uh, to your right here is Ray Firstenau. He's the Associate Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for the Office of Nuclear Energy, and his office is responsible for conducting research on current and future nuclear energy systems, maintaining government's nuclear energy research infrastructure, and establishing a path forward for the future, which is what we're going to hear about in this session. A little background, he was the Chief of Nuclear Safety under, under, under the Undersecretary of Energy from June 2012 to 2013. Uh, he has a U.S. Uh, military academy background and his master's in science degree from the nuclear science and engineering from Idaho State University. Uh, next is Alan Eisenhower. Uh, he's the associate lab director for nuclear science and engineering at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. And I do understand his fifth cousin is actually the other Eisenhower, right, which is an important connection to today. <laughs> Uh, in, at Adams for Peace, which is why he's here today. Uh, Alan has more than 30 years' experience in nuclear, uh, including research and development on a range of fuel cycle topics, and it, such as enrichment, radiochemical processing, stable and radioisotope production, nuclear fuels, radiation effects, etc. Before joining Oak Ridge, uh, Eisenhower was a commissioned officer in the U.S. Navy, uh, serving as a nuclear, on a nuclear submarine, which is a great background for this kind of work. Uh, and after leaving active duty, he continued as a reservist, uh, and he holds an MS and PhD degrees in nuclear engineering from UT, University of Tennessee. Um, next uh, is uh, Jeff Binder, who at Argonne doesn't need that much of an introduction, but I'm going to give it anyway. Uh, he's the Associate Lab Director for Energy and Global Security here at Argonne. Uh, his directorate applies uh, expertise in science and engineering throughout the, from, throughout the lab and information systems to deliver on environmentally sound solutions to challenges in energy access and global security, nuclear being a big part of that. Jeff joined Argonne from the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, where he was founding director of the Illinois Applied Research Institute. Uh, he was an Oak Ridge National Laboratory uh, and, and joined there in 2003 and worked his way up to an ALD there as well for nuclear science and engineering. Uh, he holds a PhD, MS, and BS degrees in nuclear engineering from the University of Illinois, as well as, very importantly, an MBA from the University of Chicago. Uh, and, and last but not least, uh, probably doesn't need any introduction here, uh, Mark Peters, who's currently director of Idaho National Labs. Uh, INL, as many of you know, is, uh, is the DOE's nuclear lab focused on nuclear energy, national and homeland security, energy and environmental science and technology. Uh, Mark also serves as the senior advisor to DOE on nuclear energy technology research and development. Previously, he was here, as you know, he was a deputy associate lab director for energy sciences. Associate Lab Director for Energy and Global Security, and worked closely with me personally on, as Deputy Lab Director for programs here at the lab. He serves as an expert advisor to DOE Advanced Fuel Cycle Initiative and the, and the Advanced Fuel Cycle Initiative National Campaign. So with that introduction, I thought I would just make a few comments to frame things out, and then uh, turn this over to Ray, who will give a, a brief introduction to the, the greater, greater topic. So I think it takes a real lot of courage. Our job is to talk about the future of nuclear energy, and it really takes a lot of courage, especially in the U.S., to talk about the future. It takes a lot of unusual courage. The story of the nuclear generation in this country has really been a zigzag narrative. It's gone back and forth for years. And so, for example, in 1973, the United States AEC, the Atomic Energy Commission, predicted that we would have, by the year 2000, uh, over 1,000 reactors producing electricity. As many of you know, of course, that prediction didn't come to be, mostly because of huge cost overruns, but also because of Three Mile Island. That accident really did change the way we viewed nuclear. Uh, more than 100 orders at the time for reactors uh, had, been, had been placed, uh, including many that were under construction were canceled in the 70s and 80s, uh, and that led to some bankruptcies and, and, and the rest is history. Another dramatic pivot came in 15 years ago when President George Bush uh, announced the Nuclear Power 2010 program in which hailed the dawn everybody for nuclear renaissance. And that program uh, solicited many, many proposals uh, in, in the um, dozens of proposals put forward in the early 2000s, only to be sidetracked by the global financial crisis that occurred then, followed by fracking-enabled uh, cheap natural gas, followed by increasingly competitive prices for renewable energy. And so all this stuff, again, threatened to derail nuclear. And all the time, while the U.S. policy has sort of zigzagged back and forth, other countries have jumped into the nuclear power. China has now 37 nuclear reactors. Uh, there are currently 24 new reactors in China under construction. As you know, France is 
75% uh, nuclear powered electricity. And as we heard this morning, Korea is doing an amazing job running up to, continues to uh, sustain since the early 60s a program in nuclear, uh, with a lot of nuclear power, but also in actually building new power plants. We also heard the UK is on a very positive path forward. Uh, so these are all very positive notes. And despite, so today, despite all of this checkered history in the US civil nuclear energy ecosystem remains robust. Uh, America continues to exert leadership in nuclear security and nonproliferation, and DOE offers both capacity and the expertise in shaping the direction of nuclear energy. Now, there's one feature I want to mention about CP1, because that's what today's about, and I wanted to bring it back to that. Not only gave birth to the atomic age, as we've heard so beautifully all day, it also gave, ra gave rise to another very important feature of American nuclear, and that's the national laboratory system. Uh, and exemplified in CP1, which we just heard in a beautiful discussion on chemistry, it was a very multidisciplinary, large team trying to solve a single problem. And that feature, which started with CP1, Enrico Fermi, Arthur Holly Compton, all the heroes you've heard about today, uh, really gave birth to what is now the National Labs and the feature in how National Labs work. They have three special features, in my opinion. First, a mission-driven science agenda, so great science fundamental science, but driven by really big important problems like nuclear. Number two, um, they're able to form large multidisciplinary teams. So you can put material scientists, chemists, uh, you can put computational science and engineers all under one roof to solve a really tough problem. Nuclear is one example, batteries are another example. And these kinds of teams are what make the National Labs unique. And the third piece, we're sitting in one of them here, are the national facilities. So much like we heard this morning as to how the UK has thought about it, in the US, these types of things have, have these types of labs have, have provided these major facilities, whether it's a, a test reactor or whether it's a synchrotron, uh, and supported well by the Department of Energy. So that sort of is how I've thought about this. And if you think about all this zigzagging in US history and nuclear, it's really the national labs who have kept tight, uh, a tight connection back to these big problems, in particular in nuclear. And we're gonna hear about that today, not just about what has been, but more importantly, what's in the future. So in this panel, we consider the role that nuclear energy will and must play in the future energy economy and how DOE can lead and shape the US path forward. So with that, I'll turn this over to uh, Ray for a few framing comments. Uh, thank, thank you, Eric. Uh, and I, before I get started, I know it, most, most all the speakers have, have related back to uh, CP1 and the history of that and, and, and how it tied into work that they're doing, whether you know it's here in this country or other countries. And I was a little bit worried before I was coming here that what, what, what do I have that can relate to that? And then a couple weeks ago, I got really lucky. I got uh, an unsolicited email, and you kind of worry about unsolicited email sometimes, but uh, I got it from a person, I won't name the name yet, that uh, said, hey, here's a little bit of history uh, that I, I wanted to share with you. And, and I, I, I asked the person, hey, is it okay if I read your story here? Because it's, it's really fascinating. So if I may, I'll, I want to take a few minutes to, to read this. Uh, uh, in September 1947, as an August uh, MS graduate in chemical engineering, engineering from the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, I was hired by Argonne National Lab to work on the redox solvent extraction pilot plant. Not CP1, but it's still, well, uh, it's, it's still good. Um, the, the redox uh, process was the predecessor of the Purex process using methyl isobutyl ketone rather than uh, tributyl phosphate TBP as the actinide solvent. He felt that it was important to put that in his note here. Um, it, it was the first chemical separation process to recover both uranium and plutonium, the business phos uh, bismuth phosphate precipitation process used during wartime recovered only plutonium. Following the Argonne National Lab pilot plant testing, redox was installed as a full-scale separations process at Hanford for the post-war weapons buildup following the Soviet nuclear weapons detonation in 1949. The redox pilot plant was installed in the same location as had been the Chicago Pile 1, the squash court underneath the west stands of Stagg Field on the University of Chicago campus. The walls of the large room still had the old squash court markings, and there was still graphite dust in the room, uh, a room corner. Everything and everybody then was in a really real hurry. 
he said, he, he, I lived in a fraternity house on University Boulevard across from university buildings and walked four blocks to work each day. Again, this was in September 1947. On December 2nd, 1947, there was a small lunchtime ceremony outside the entrance of the West Stands and a small plaque was affixed to the outer wall commemorating the fifth anniversary of Chicago Pile One's initial criticality. I walked out of the building and joined a small crowd for the ceremony. Uh, drawings of the original group at the initial criticality, no photographs were taken at that time, shows uh, Fermi, Wigner, Zinn, Agnew, Zillard, and others standing on a visitor's platform at the edge of the court with the pile below. I think we saw that drawing in the little museum uh, last night. Now, that platform was our pilot plant control room and the rather crude open lifting device used to stack the, the pile's graphite blocks uh, was our vertical observation platform for scanning the packed separations column uh, for crud buildup and interface control. The redox hot tests were run with aluminum clad radiated fuel from the Hanford production reactors. During one experiment, we shouldn't listen to this part, but I, be I better read it anyway. During one experiment, a slug was dropped from its shielded transport uh, carrier and had to be retrieved with a long-handled tool. If anyone reported that film badges were removed for those who did the retrieving in order to avoid overexposure, that would of course be uh, vehemently denied. It simply did not happen. This is 1947, okay? Um, uh, he, he says, he says if I left uh, Argonne National Lab in August 1948 to enter MIT for my doc doctoral studies, but I remember the redox plant pilot plant experience fondly, except for the graveyard shift uh, during the 1947-48 uh, winter when Chicago can get a bit chilly. So I don't know if anybody knows who this person is, some of you may, but uh, he still works for the Department of Energy. He's over 91 years old. He works in the Office of Nuclear Energy, Jim Brzee. And if any of you have, have ever met him, he's, he, uh, he looks at least 20 years younger and has more energy than most of us in this room. So as far as somebody with the history and, and kind of, you know, we talk about data mining, but it, it's, it's important to pick the brains of people like him to, uh, through their experiences, what they learned and how it applies to what we're, what we're doing today and in the future. So I thought that was a kind of a neat story to uh, share. There's, there's still people out there that have this background, and we still have one working in, uh, in DOE. So, um, with that, I, I wanted to uh, uh, go on with my talk, and uh, I'll just set, set the stage for the discussion among the panel members. And, and I, uh, during my introduction remarks, I really want, as I talk about the Office of Nuclear Energy priorities, I really want to emphasize the importance of the national labs and uh, especially uh, Argonne and, and, and Oak Ridge and Idaho and how they play into helping uh, the Office of Nuclear Energy uh, in, in our priorities as we look ahead. So, you know, in, uh, since the new administration, I, I first want to start that I, I really, the theme of my talk is very optimistic. I, I'm going to start with optimism and end with optimism because the president came to over to our building on, on June 29th and really set the stage for the importance of, uh, of nuclear energy in, in our nuclear energy, uh, in our policy and, and as an energy resource. And, and uh, you know, Secretary Perry has been doing the same thing ever since he, he's gotten there. And, and I, I think the administration is really very committed to nuclear energy as, as, uh, as a vital component to our energy portfolio. And, and many of you know the president, uh, while he was at DOE, called for a complete review of our, of our uh, nuclear energy policy. And, and that's uh, uh, just, getting, just getting started. So we, we in the Office of Nuclear Energy, with, with, this, with this charge, if you will, we're, we're working to revive, revitalize, and expand our nuclear energy uh, capacity and capability, and we, we need the national labs to do that. Okay, we, we developed this slide uh, 
uh, at, at the prompting of, uh, of our boss, Ed McGinnis. And, and at first glance, it may think, okay, how much more can you get on one slide? But, but it, it does kind of um, uh, tell, tell the story. And like I said before, I, I'm an optimist, so I see the yellow curve as, as uh, where we, where we want to go, and I think we can go. You know, you have a, you have a pessimistic view here, you know, at the rate that uh, we're, we're, we're losing plants, that if we don't do something, we could, by the 2030 time frame, we, we, it, with continued premature, premature shutdowns, not, not be, be in a very good position with nuclear. And even with the pres present announced closures, if we don't do something, you can see with the EIA projections there uh, where we're going to be with uh, 93 units and a lower percentage of nuclear. And, but, but I see us being able to do with, with improved um, uh, market and, and regulatory uh, uh, path that, that will maintain the units we have, get the two units uh, going at uh, Vogel, and, and as we emphasize, uh, advanced reactors have, have new builds coming up. And when I talk about advanced reactors, I also talk about small modular reactors, whether, the, whether they're light water cooled or gas cooled or molten salt, you, you name it, uh, really anything that hasn't been built yet is an advanced reactor. So I'm, I'm really, the rest of this discussion is really going to be in an in a optimistic tone, which is the, the yellow line there. Um, I won't spend a lot of time on the, on the NE mission, and we're, we're, we're kind of um, rewriting some of our vision and mission uh, as we speak, but, the, but really, it, it, these bullets, we really need the labs involved, working with industry and working with the government to, to make, this, uh, make this mission happen. And we can, we, uh, I, I truly believe we can, working together, we can resolve the technical costs, safety and security and regulatory issues with our labs, with our industry partners and, and with government all working together. What I wanted to uh, spend the next few minutes on was this slide, and this is kind of lining up our mission priorities. So as we're developing the, the uh, future bu budgets in the, um, in the Office of Nuclear Energy, the, uh, looking ahead into FY19, uh, and, and even, even as we get uh, FY, uh, the 18, FY18 budget, Settled. We, we're really talking in terms of these mission priorities, and what's been mentioned uh, several times. You know, our colleague from Exxon, the existing fleet. We do have to worry about the existing fleet, and and some of the programs we're supporting and supported by industry as well as the national labs under the existing fleet or light water reactor sustainability, and that program. Uh, we work with EPRI and others in the industry to see, okay, what can we do to help uh, maintain the existing fleet with life extensions, uh, cost efficiency improvements, for example, looking ahead, maybe new water chemistry that might, might, be, might, be, might be cheaper and, and better to use in existing water chemistry, advanced sensors in, in, in the reactors. Uh, we're also... Uh, one of our higher priority programs under the existing fleet is, uh, as was mentioned before, is accident tolerant fuels. We're pursuing, uh, pursuing three concepts, GE, Areva, and Westinghouse, in doing uh, 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 development of those advanced fuels, not just for accident tolerance, but for, for uh, abil ability to maybe operate plants cheaper uh, based on the uh, characteristics of those accident tolerant fuels. And when we started this program along with it, we also, and this gets into supporting infrastructure where the labs help, we, we uh, are in the process of restarting the TREAT reactor, which is a transient reactor in Idaho that tied to doing uh, uh, high power burst testing on samples that would then be used uh, in, in the helping with the regulatory basis to qualify these fuels. And, and that's been a great joint effort with Idaho National Lab and, and uh, Argonne National Lab in particular, because many of you know the in the Idaho site where the treat reactor is located used to be Argonne National Laboratory West, and Argonne still has a lot of the expertise that was developed, uh, helped develop that treat reactor. And I, I, many of you know I was in Idaho many, many years, and I, I still recall how well the, the Argonne uh, staff 
laid up that reactor in 1994, how well it was maintained, how well it was documented, and, and uh, probably at the point where it's ready to do initial physics testing uh, in, a, in a month or two, which is well ahead of schedule, uh, well under budget, and really looking forward to the, to the experiment testing to support the um, uh, accident tolerant fuel program. Excellent example of the labs working together to help us uh, focus in on these, these missions for the, for the existing fleet. Uh, next on the advanced reactor pipeline, and, and of course this is, this is an area that, uh, uh, of course, uh, the existing fleet has a high priority. Probably most of the funding goes into advanced reactor pipeline and areas of emphasis uh, you'll see now in our, in our budgets and our programs and you'll see in the future is first of a kind SMRs. And, and in, in that would be like, uh, for example, the new scale uh, light water reactor design that uh, uh, is right now, uh, the design certification application was received by the um, NRC in January, early January of, of, of this year. And it's looking like that's going along pretty well for the for uh, getting the design certification. I think they predicted around 40, 42 months, and it's, it's following that schedule now. And, and, uh, and then other SMRs, uh, other design could be another light water, might be something other than light water. Then one thing that we, we, we're kind of at its infancy now, but we have started in FY17 a little bit and, and have, it, have it in our 18 request and we'll also have it hopefully at a larger scale in our FY19 request is the versatile advanced test reactor or, uh, or fast neutron source. But what, what we're really lacking in our, in our suite of neutron sources, of course we have HIFER, We've got uh, the advanced test reactor, excellent uh, machines for, uh, for, for thermal fluxes and material and uh, fuel testing, but we just don't have that fast neutron flux machine that, that can really get us the high displacements per atom that we really think we need to push materials to the, to the limits. And we really need the laboratory expertise to develop that, that expertise and, and hopefully uh, get something uh, built. We're probably in a three-year R&D phase and, and then maybe get something built uh, in, the, in the middle of uh, the next decade. Another thing that uh, a ma major area in ad advanced reactor pipeline, for lack of a better term, I'll call it a generic advanced reactor R&D. It's focusing on, on uh, 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 molten salt, gas cooled, and fast reactors and the various type of fast reactors. So you'll see uh, em emphasis in those areas, both with industry partners as well as, uh, as, well as the national labs. And one, one other thing that uh, we're, we're taking advantage of uh, is advances in modeling and simulation. Many of you know we have the NEMS program, the Nuclear Energy Advanced Modeling and Simulation, and uh, Ellen, the hub, with the Castle Hub, we've talked about that as, as well, and how can we use that horsepower in, in the computing, um, uh, uh, in the computing advances to benefit the advancement of uh, nuclear energy? And I think the, I think the machine capability and the modeling capability pr probably is out ahead of can you validate that? You know, because until you can have the have the data and the uh, the experiments and the measurement capability to validate the data, then the modeling and simulation really isn't, isn't complete. So that's where the national laboratories have a big role to play. And also in, um, in the uh, nuclear science user facilities, I know in Idaho I mentioned TREAT, uh, uh, the advanced test reactor, the, the suite of uh, uh, advanced uh, uh, post-radiation examination uh, uh, facilities and equipment uh, across the DOE complex because with, you know, you can radiate stuff all day long, but if you can't uh, examine it and look at it and learn from it, it doesn't uh, do you a lot of good. So we've got a lot of investments in the mission support activities that support advanced reactor development as well as the existing fleet. I wanted to also mention, and I'm bringing these topics up to kind of stimulate the discussion with the, with the labs here, because it really all plays into what, you, what the labs do for us. Uh, the GAIN initiative was touched on a little bit. The, that's the gateway for accelerated innovation in nuclear. 
And it's, and it's really, a, a organization, really an organizing principle more than it is a, a, a line. It's really not a line, line budget. But, um, and the, the labs here in particular, Oregon, Idaho, and Oak Ridge, are really key players in that. And what that was developed for back in late uh, uh, 2015 was to provide easier access for new reactor developers uh, to have access to the lab capabilities, the user facilities, the data, the expertise. And we, we kicked that off in 2016 with a, a couple million dollars. We called them small business vouchers, but basically it, it allowed uh, a voucher to gain expertise from the lab. And I think uh, Jake DeWitt, I don't see him here now. Oh, there's Jake. I think you've, you're our testimonial here. You've taken advantage of it, I think, twice, uh, once, once in 2016, I think, with uh, Argonne and Idaho, and then again in 2017, we upped the ante a little bit and, and put in 4.2 million for vouchers, and I think you're doing work with Sandia and Argonne as well, and I, I think you would agree that's been very helpful for a company like, like yours in the, in, the, in the stage you're at in reactor development. Uh, and, and what's also coming out of the GAIN initiative are the, the formation of technology working groups. I mentioned the advance, advanced um, uh, reactor R&D areas in molten salt and uh, high temperature gas and fast reactor, and there's working groups that involve industry, uh, uh, the innovators like, like, like Jake and the laboratories in, in deciding, okay, helping us decide where should we where, where should the R&D investments be in those areas? Uh, and earlier today, Steve Binkley mentioned the, the basic research needs, and, and I think that's very important because that helps inform, that helps inform the Office of Nuclear Energy as well. I, I really got to uh, you know, uh, hand it to Steve. Steve's very good at, at walking down the hall and saying, okay, what are you guys doing? How can we help? And, and I, I, th I think he was really a driver for helping uh, 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 hold that uh, workshop uh, need. So the, the offices have to have to work together. And then I'll, I'll, I'll close with the the, uh, the fuel cycle infrastructure. And one thing we we, we uh, found out very early as we were de looking at developing um, new reactor concepts, in particular some of the fast reactor concepts, was really a lack of high assay LEU. Uh, for those of you that might not be familiar with the terminology, of course. Commercial reactors run off of uh, three to five percent uh, enrichment, but the uh, but the, it, some of the advanced reactors and and uh, uh, run off of higher higher enrichment, which we just don't have that domestic capability right now. And uh, there's very limited supplies of of HEU in the DOE system that could be downblended to support that. So we we see a very, uh, very much in the next uh, several years a need to develop that domestic capability for for a high assay LAU. So we're starting an initiative in that area as well. So, so with that, Eric, I was gonna turn it back over to the panel to maybe start to get into the discussion on some of these things. So. Thank you, thank you, okay. Ray. So uh, just a few words on the, is this on? Yeah, just a few words on the format. I'm gonna start this conversation with a question for each of our panelists. Uh, I hope you have questions, but please hold those for a little while. We'll come to the audience shortly. Uh, and then uh, come back to the panel for some, some last words. And I think what I'll do, let me just go this way. We just heard from Ray. Let me start with Mark at the end there. Um, Mark, um, um, when you think about energy science, you think about security, climate change, there's this cluster or nexus of complicated issues that all come together around this pressing challenges. How do you think of the national labs embedded in the ecosystem? How do the national labs work with universities, work with partners in the private sector to accelerate innovation and enable things to really break here in the U.S.? Well, it's nice to be with you all. hope everybody's doing well. Um, uh, thanks, Eric. Uh, I think I'll build on what Ray said, and I, I want to give it a little bit more on the GAIN initiative. It's been talked about a lot, but the history of it was, in fact, being responsive to the companies that were out there that were saying there was a tremendous capability at the laboratories. Uh, not just to provide support, but actually partnership, innovate, innovation partnership with the labs. And, and so we created it, and I would argue that it's a starting point, but if we're serious about doing, addressing these issues on an, on an urgent timescale, which we, it is an urgent timescale, 
um, that it's got to it's got to actually grow. And I don't mean funding. I mean in terms of breadth. Eric sort of mentioned it. Open up the open up gain. That's that's what you were talking about, right? It's got to it's got to grow to be even more than what it is now. I think we do have examples where it's working well. Um, it leads to so it's everything from test beds to actually providing government sites for demonstrations. It's it's the whole it's the whole suite that I think will allow us to accelerate. And it's not just climate change urgency. Uh, most recently, a couple of us were in Aspen at a, at a workshop, and I think the consensus of that group, it was a future of nuclear energy workshop, and it was chaired by Joe Dominguez from Exelon and uh, Dan Poneman, who that name means something to everybody in here. And I think the consensus of that group was is that the window's closing here pretty quick. We really only have a few years here from a U.S. perspective to get back in the game or we're not in the game. Can I, can I follow that up? I yeah. Mean, so, so the national labs, as, as we discussed earlier, have maintained, I mean, through a lot of, through the, the DOE support, has maintained a lot of the, the engineers' science. I mean, most of it, right? Uh, universities look like they're actually building up. More students are coming into the universities. In terms of industrial partnerships, though, do we have the, do we have the complement on the, let's say, on the commercial side to, to make this ecosystem really work the way you, you describe? Oh, I, th I think we do. I, I think, we, yeah, I mean, Jake was one example, but there's, the ecosystem's actually quite robust on the industrial side, particularly when you think about light water SMRs and, and, and beyond. Uh, not to ignore the existing fleet, but it's there. And, and, and by the way, it's not just about how we provide the people and the facilities and the capabilities, but also how do we, uh, the important, how do you wire together the partnerships? How do you deal with all the IP? How do you deal with all that? We're working all that together because to me, it shouldn't matter whether you come to INL or to Argonne or Oak Ridge or Los Alamos or PNL. I don't care where you go. It should be easier to work with the labs. So there's a component of that that, you know, we've been trying to attack for what a decade. So, but it's there. Good. Thanks, Jeff. Um, you know, one of the things about the national labs is they are this uh, this in, in, in some sense uh, dream, sort of dream sets of of things from material science, computation, uh, chemistry, etc. And we heard about a lot of it today. Uh, as well as thinking about advanced manufacturing and the future of how do we innovate in many different areas. Um, can you say something about how, uh, how this all works with respect to the next generation of, of reactors in terms of, of uh, you know, global energy markets? Sure, sure. Uh, thanks. Uh, it's a good question, Eric. I, you know, I, I, first off, I want to say thank you for, 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 for everybody that's come today, and this has been really an exciting event. And, uh, and before I answer the question, which I will, I, I wanted to just uh, acknowledge, uh, I see Art Wright back there. Art, can you raise your hand? So, so Art is the guy who, Ray, who really pulled that background information out from the treat background. And, and I think that kind of collaboration, you know, where, where Art understood treat, when's the last time we brought a reactor back offline to, 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 to be, to, you know, to work again and, and to contribute to the program. So I wanted to acknowledge that Art was here. Um, but let me get back to the question. So, so I, you know, I think this is something that, that I think many of us started thinking about probably in, in much more earnest, maybe 10, 15 years ago, which is how do we connect modern scientific approaches to really moving innovation in, in nuclear technology? And, um, you know, I, when I was at, at ORNL in those days, you know, you know I, we all know this, we've, we've got these, these, we've got these old hot cells and we had these old capabilities, but in the meantime, materials in other places, you know, semiconductors or advanced energy materials in, in other spaces, were moving forward, um, advanced simulation, right, uh, was moving forward in a very, in a very fast way and in a certain degree we were missing it a little bit in the nuclear industry right and uh, and i think i think over the last 10 years or so we've really been trying to work now to try to get that reconnected i think you know the castle program that's uh at ornl has tried to bring modern modern uh, model, modeling and simulation into the picture over the last 10 15 years we've seen investment in bringing modern scientific tools into uh, the materials and fuels complex uh, in, in Idaho uh, Falls, what used to be known as Ar Argonne West. Um, and, and I think that's now put us in a position to maybe really start making some impact. But, but, I, but I will tell you, I don't believe we're there yet. I think, you know, we have to find ways to shrink that time to qualify things, you know. Um, this is something we're thinking very hard about here at Argonne um, through a manufacturing initiative. Uh, you heard May May Lee talk earlier about how we could apply hard x-rays 
uh, to, to activities. Andrew Siegel talked about applying our exascale computing capability to really shrink those innovation times. I think it's absolutely critical. So the, 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 uh, I talk a lot about this, but I talk about this late. The, the first patent was submitted for laser sintering additive manufacturing in 1986. The first component that went into a jet, which was a, a fuel nozzle, uh, that was made by laser sintering, fully qualified, 2016, 30 years. That's in the airline industry. I, I don't want to be negative, but you might say in the nuclear industry, that time constant is probably infinity right now. And, uh, and, and we, have to, we have to find a way through predictive tools, through advanced scientific methods to shrink those time scales. You know, Jake really mentioned the importance of that, I think, in being able to connect. And so these activities like GAIN, I think, are really key. And, and the last point I want to make, and this is something I've been thinking a lot about, is, you know, the technology readiness level uh, idea is almost now being misused to kind of uh, to kind of hurting us a bit in the sense of if you if you know that the history of TRL was it came out of NASA so that they could understand how, how where they were in a process before they could put an astronaut on on top of a bomb to shoot him into the, into the into the uh, a controlled bomb of course you know but to shoot him into space um, we but the actual innovation process is not a nicely defined linear thing. And there's not these sort of neat handoffs from the scientists to the engineer to the industry. And we have to work much more closely because these processes are much more integrated than, we, than, than sometimes we characterize through something like TRL. And I think, I think as we look at these things and, and push on these questions, I think we really are at a point now where we can start making some progress. So Alan, uh, uh, Jeff actually mentioned uh, going from infinite time to get uh, next generation reactors out to something finite. Can you say a little bit about how, uh, how the confluence of, of, of computing, simulation, maybe even artificial intelligence can help not just on the reactor design side, but also on the validation and, and ultimately on, on things like licensing. Can you say a few words about that? Sure, sure, and thank you uh, for, for honoring me by letting me be here with you today. Uh, this is just a tremendous event that you've put together. Uh, Jeff hit it on the head when he said, you know, the timelines are too long, and as a result, things are too costly. So what is it that we can bring to bear? And certainly within the National Laboratory System, very near this building, uh, we have tremendous computing assets available to us. And that's great and all the geeks can use those and we can but the key is how do we translate those types of capabilities into the hands of industry and regulators how can we put together things that can be useful and an example of such a transition that's been mentioned several times here today is castle the consortium for advanced simulation of light water reactors which many of you are probably familiar with uh, but CASEL is a collaboration between universities, industry, and the national laboratories. And it's demonstrating how you can bring high fidelity modeling simulation to bear on practical problems. So some examples of what CASEL has done. If you, uh, CASEL has modeled uh, 20 years worth of operation of Watts Bar Unit 1. That's 14 cycles. And, and during that, uh, Watts Bar actually experienced this thing called SIPS. CRUD, there's another, that's an embedded acronym within an acronym, but it's CRUD Induced Power Shift. And Castle, by performing the multi-physics modeling, so the neutronics, the thermohydraulics, and importantly for my chemistry friends, the chemistry of what's going on in these systems, was able actually to demonstrate that crud-induced power shift. And that's very important to understand the operational uh, behavior. So Jeff mentioned this thing about predictiveness. And that's the key. We need to be able to predict things, not just look in, in the past. 
And so Castle, again, uh, before Watts Bar Unit 2 started up, performed a calculation that modeled the, the startup and the power ascension, put that on the shelf, and then after, after uh, the startup, compared the data, and it compared very well. So it was actually a true prediction. So the key is to be able to take these types of models, these types of high fidelity capabilities, make sure they're on machines that actually can be run by industry or the NRC, and then use these results to reduce these cycle times, to reduce the number of experiments that you have to, to do. Uh, but you will not totally eliminate the experiments, but you can shape the experiments that you need to do going forward. Can you just say a little bit more about uh, validation? And you talked about um, CRUD, right, and uh, modeling. And of course, you know, it's uh, computing, computational capabilities are really moving very fast, in some ways faster than we're able to actually validate some of those. So can you say a little bit about the importance of the experimental side and how uh, you're validating? The, uh, just let me finish, but yeah. not only the, the individual components, but even thinking on a systems level, when you start thinking about putting these components together, it's quite different than analyzing a single materials process. And, and certainly that points to the need for test beds. So as you perform uh, the modeling and simulation, you can narrow down, identify the types of experiments. There's a lot of historical data that you can draw upon, for example, drawing upon the, the 20 years worth of, of uh, Watts Bar data. Uh, but it also can inform what type of information do I really need? How do I need to instrument uh, existing reactors, or what types of experiments do I need to do? Because ultimately, uh, you do have to, to validate these codes. And there are still challenges in that area. And one final follow-up on that is, is the, the regulatory side and licensing side. And uh, you know, it's part of the reason it's an infinite problem is that it takes a long time to get licensed for the next level reactor. So what, what is the thinking now about simulations and as a way to accelerate uh, getting through the, the regulatory processes? So we're, we're seeing the NRC is starting to embrace these types of approaches. And going back to the Castle example, uh, there is a test stand that's being established with NRC starting next fiscal year. And this is an opportunity for uh, the NRC staff to use these types of tools and to see their utility in that type of regime. And so a lot of this is kind of education about how to use these types of tools and, and making them available. Thanks. Um, Ray, a uh, question for you. I want to come back to some of the comments you made when you were standing up and also what, uh, what we heard from Mark about the national labs and uh, the ecosystem working with industry. Um, where, in your, from a DOE perspective, where, where does the work that's being done within the labs now, we mentioned three here, we have three represented here on the, the line here, uh, where does the, the research and development uh, end for labs and where should it start for industry? How are you envisioning this interaction with the industry? And Mark talked a bit about that, but can you elaborate from a DOE perspective how you think about that? Yeah, I, that's a... That's not an easy question to answer, but, but it, it, uh, I think something that uh, 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 Jeff brought up with regards to, you, you, you know, if you define strictly at a TRL level where you, okay, you're done at the national lab level and then somebody picks it up at a TRL level, I think it's, it's it, it, uh, uh, that, that hard line doesn't work well and, and it probably depends. Uh, I guess to, uh, the first answer to the question is it it's there there's some capabilities that that might have to take farther that that the national labs need to play a a, a larger part in uh, test beds was mentioned for example and I, I think I see a, a government role is helping provide those test beds to to prove out some some concepts. Um, uh, I guess one example that that comes to mind I'm most familiar with is that the Idaho National Lab, where from a test bed standpoint, we, we helped enable uh, 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 the site use permit to allow uh, new scale uh, through, through a utility called UAMPS, which is a consortium of uh, municipal um, power uh, 
providers in the Intermountain West, about 45 of them or so, to look, they're looking at, at a new scale designed to, to uh, take place, uh, to replace some of their coal plants in the middle of the next decade. And they looked at, at, at the attractiveness of the Idaho National Laboratory site to, to, to uh, build the first reactor and provide power there. there it was the, the power distribution systems. A lot of that already existed. You had a lot of expertise. You had, uh, of course, a large expanse of land and, and uh, a, 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 willing, a willing community and a willing neighbor. And those things, they saw that as some, some knowns that took some of the risk out of, of making a decision. Of course, they haven't made a decision to build one yet, but, but that's where I think uh, the national labs from a testbed perspective can help take some of the risk out of the, the new development, offering not just their, their capabilities, but their, but their facilities and their people and their facilities and their machines and the, the whole land space that, that makes up the national lab complex has a, has a huge advantage. Maybe, maybe I'll ask one last question to anybody who wants to answer it, which is the question of innovation. And um, you know, we heard a lot of discussion today about different reactors, starting with the morning and the European Korean, our own version of reactors, whether it's light or light, light water reactors or, or boiling water reactors or, um, or more, more advanced designs. And you said advanced meant anything that we weren't thinking about today. Because of the cost of everything we're talking about, just demonstrating, des describing, burning in a new reactor, is there room for innovation? I mean, we hear about the traveling wave reactor, for example, which hasn't been validated yet, but all these interesting ideas. Is there, in this business, room for innovation where, where I think labs can also be of high value in thinking, you know, what's really revolutionary here? What's other ways? I mean, small modular reactors is kind of the most recent revolutionary idea, but mostly that's a business model revolution. Are there ideas in terms of reactors that would be even worth pursuing, or do we know enough and we know exactly what we need to do to get a gigawatt in a reactor? So, yes, is the short answer. Um, uh, but, I mean, you know, let's talk about it in classes. So, and there are varying levels of technological maturity, but, you know, these three labs are actually the ones where you could sort of trace back to molten salt technology liquid metal technology as well as high temperature gas technology, which are th three of the primary ones that are sort of out there vying for position in the advanced reactor space. And um, there is a lot of room for innovation. The companies that are popping up in the US and, and across the globe, and for those countries like China and Russia that are more government, sort of government owned, they're also exploring these concepts. But they're building on some of that foundation, but they're definitely innovating. I mean, the TWR is an example. Some of the molten salt technology, Alan could speak a lot better than I could, is incredibly innovative. Um, and going to dissolve fuel and all kinds of interesting concepts that are really, really different. So what I like about the idea of partnering with industry isn't just to provide the capability, but then we can then part, it's an innovation partnership to me. Because we do have staff at all of our laboratories who are ready to be a part of that innovation. What I like about it is it's industry driven. And that's what it needs to be, because that's where the, ultimately, it's got to it's be built by someone out in the private sector. Um, so I think, we've, I think the U.S. has kind of lost our way a bit on that, but I'll say this at the end again, but I think what the ecosystem we have now provides us the opportunity to get back in leadership. Yeah, and just, I completely, I completely agree with Mark, and I think, you know, I think the innovation can occur at, at different levels. We need to think innovatively about regulation. We need to think innovatively about business models and, and how we and how we construct. But but you know the in, it, but then you have to ask yourself as a as a scientist or an engineer: Is there a physics case to be made for innovation? Is there is there something that we can get right? You know, is, is there some, and and I think that answer is certainly yes. I mean. Jake, again, you know, he talked about, you know, just fundamentally the energy density that you have there. That, that, are we really taking full advantage of that? Uh, I would say no. We got to go to higher temperatures. We look, we need to look at different chemistry capabilities. We need to look at advanced materials and advanced uh, construction techniques. Um, I mean, I'll be bold. Uh, you know, why would, why would we not 3D print a reactor? You know, and, 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 and it has a 30 year fuel lifetime and, it has built in the, the sensing capability and the control systems and, and, and you know, that's a, bold, that's a bold thing to think about, but you know, is it, is it impossible? I don't think so. And um, I think we need to be thinking on, 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 that, on those edges 
uh, as well, because I think the physics case is there to do it. So leave it to the three lab guys to say there's room for innovation. <laughs> yeah, what do you expect? Uh, and, and I do believe that, and to me the evidence, again, is when I look at Jake and I look at all these companies out there that are stepping forward, this is not laboratory driven. You know, all this energy around advanced reactors is coming from companies that see an opportunity where they can make a difference and hopefully make some money eventually too. Uh, and do that. So there is room, and there's room across, I think, uh, the spectrum of activities that, that you look at, whether it be how do you go about building these reactors, how do you operate them, how many people do you need, really need there, uh, how do you deal with the waste, what types of products do you make, how do you use the reactor, not necessarily just as an electricity machine, but as a heat source, and, and apply those products. So I think there's a range of innovations that uh, can be brought in the marketplace and certainly we believe the laboratories have a role in that we can contribute to the technology uh, that, the developments that are needed. Eric, were you gonna go to Ray? Well, go, go ahead. No, I, I, I wanted to briefly, we've talked, regulatory's been mentioned a couple times but it hasn't been talked about that much today. And, and it's, it's important to note that the, this is now a U.S.-centric reflection, although UK, Canada, and others are looking at how does the licensing framework play into next generation reactors. But the U.S. NRC is collaborating with DOE. The labs are actively involved in helping support what is the technical basis for the regulatory framework go forward as we think about uh, next generation reactors. And, and as they see signals from industry, they're going to respond. They're, they're looking at the new scale. It's going to be a 40-month review. Um, other companies are starting to uh, engage with them. The more that happens, the more the NRC will respond. Uh, I will say that NRC leadership is very, very committed to, to uh, evolving the regulatory framework, I would say, to, to enable uh, more expedient licensing still within the right safety framework. And also, you brought up simulation and validation. Uh, I, I've had personally had conversations with the chairman where she talks about wanting to understand that better and being able to have NRC staff who can understand how do you license a reactor where you're bringing in a code that's running on an exaflot machine, for example. Yeah. And you don't need the same kind of experiments. And so they, they understand that. Uh, they have the same pipeline challenges we all do. Where do you find the people to go do it? But I, I think all that leads to a sort of coming together of everybody realizing we've got, what we've got to go do now, to me, it's action. We've got to go do it. Yeah. I mean, one thing I would say that I think is very important for this field, and it maybe goes without saying, but is attracting the you know, excited young uh, you know, engineers, scientists into the business. And um, you know, the, sometimes the field can feel stayed because of the, the you know, mostly because of regulatory. It's just hard to get new ideas, new designs in. I mean, I don't know if we'll ever design a nuclear-powered watch or, or an iPad, but, but that aside, I think the idea that somehow this becomes an exciting field, and I think the opportunity is there now, but the question really is aimed at that. But what would you say to a, uh, you know, you've, you've got kids, Mark, who are going through school. What would you say to your, any of you say to your kids or kids out there to get them to come and join a national lab or, or get trained up at a university in, in, uh, in nuclear engineering? Well, it helps that you've got, I mean, some of the, some of the um, growth in the startup space and whatnot is coming from the envir environmental movement, interestingly mm -hmm. enough. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, so I, th I think personally, I think a lot of it is about how do you save the, how do you save the world? Yeah. Uh, and that, that get, gets their attention when I talk to my, I talk to my kids about it. Secretary's talking about make nuclear cool again. I mean, yeah. that's, he's saying that a lot. He's got people inside the department thinking about what that, what that looks like and how you attract people. But, I mean, the bottom line is it's a global industry, so it's exciting. How does the U.S. maintain leadership? But you can't get away from the whole idea of the, the environmentalist influence mm -hmm. as you think about nuclear as part of the solution to mitigating climate change. That's an important part of it. Mm -hmm. So we have, I think we each have opportunities quite often to go out to universities and, and talk to these kids one, one statement I'll make, I'm always so impressed when I go to the universities and say, you know what, we're going to be in very good hands in the future when you see these kids that are coming along today. 
But one of the things I don't want to lose sight of, what we're talking about here is nuclear technology, not just nuclear energy. And it was these capabilities that started with CP1 that have been demonstrated, and they've evolved certainly into nuclear energy, which is very important, uh, but also in medicine and scientific discovery and industrial applications. So there is a, just a broad field of applications there uh, they're very important uh, for the next generation to go into, and I think we have to keep reiterating that. It's not just about energy, it's the broad field of nuclear technology that we're really talking about. Yeah, I, I wanted to make a comment on education as well, too. So I, I mentioned at lunch to Dr. Chung because I was really impressed with what he talked about with, I think it's the King's uh, uh, Educational Institute and how they're looking at the future of training nuclear engineers, but really engineers in general. And, and um, not only do I visit uh, universities, I went and stayed for three years. But um, but I you know, and I know this is a little bit probably a little bit provocative and a little bit challenging. But I think that I think when you think about the field, I'll, I'll, keep, I'll stay focused on the field of nuclear engineering. When you think about the field of nuclear engineering and how we're developing our next generation. I think, you know, what, what we saw in the Republic of Korea where they're really pushing building teams because, you know, nobody ever designed and built and operated a reactor by themselves, right? And our educational system tends to focus on individual training and individual development. I mean, certainly how I went through school. And, um, and it took me a while to learn how to work in the nuclear field because you can't do anything by yourself, right? And so, I think, you know, as we talk to the, look to the next generation, and I completely agree with Mark, I mean, I think there's excitement in, in, many, in many early career people because of the environmental potential that, that nuclear presents. But we, how we educate our students to really address these innovation needs, and we think about accelerating our innovation system, I think that's something that absolutely needs to be done. Okay, great. Why don't you yeah, I, I guess to maybe expand on what uh, Jeff's talk about it with with regard to universities, uh, I, I forgot to mention in, in my remarks, but a, a, a lo major component of of our R and D funding in the Office of Nuclear Energy. It's not a line item; you won't see it in the budget. But we we have uh, we we apply twenty percent of our our R and D funding nominally to. To, to the university, we, we call it the Consolidated University Nuclear Energy University Program that tie university research to our program needs. So we pull that off. The, the university programs are an extremely important partner with, with, with our, our national labs and even with industry to help the, the whole complement of expertise to get to get young people interested in nuclear energy and how to apply it to, to you know, real life problems in, in, in energy and in, in the environment. So very important component to our programs. Okay, so I think I'd like to open this up to uh, questions. If there are any questions in the audience. Um, do, do we have another microphone? Thanks, Pat. Yeah. Hi. Uh, first, uh, thanks everybody for, for all your time coming up here and having a conversation about the important topic of the future of nuclear. I think we're all very interested in you know, our, our entire careers hinge on, on where this goes. Uh, I, I personally think... Oh, uh, my name is Eric Fike. I work in the NWM division. Uh, my title is Site-Wide Radioactive Material Manager. So, um, uh, I, I wanted to talk just for a second about... Um, we often think... I, I, your your uh, laser sintering uh, time to industry example was really interesting to me uh, because I think the, the nuclear industry has been hampered by the ability to bring any new te technologies to the industry for a long time. We've had these aging plants that have existed and the ability to license a new plant is something that uh, got started but stalled. And um, it, it, we tend as technical people to think that the, the problem is that we need better technical solutions. We need, you know, in some extent that's true, we need better, safer, you know, uh, uh, designs and, and so forth. But, it, but in a lot of ways, the problem is, is an emotional one where uh, the public at large, you know, we don't have good answers for what low radioactivity does to a person and how that, you know, influences the kinds of uh, ways people receive the prospect of a new nuclear power plant near them or what to do with waste. That's partly a technical problem, but it's very much an emotional problem too. So uh, what I'm getting at is to what extent 
are you all aware of programs designed to treat that aspect of it? You know, uh, improving the regulatory environment, which has pressure from the public sector on, on how these designs are brought to fruition, and what are we doing to influence the culture that people think of nuclear power from? I, I think you hit a very important topic there, uh, is how do we communicate about it? And certainly many of us that came through school a little while ago, we didn't really learn how to communicate about these types of things. We did a really good job learning how to operate our HP calculator and you know, be a geek. Uh, but how do, you, how do you do the very fundamental thing of communicating about this technology? And this was actually a discussion at this Aspen uh, conference, but one of the things, and you said, do you know of something that's being done around that? The, I know the Nuclear Energy Institute has initiated a campaign uh, to, to bring out the benefits of nuclear, and they've got a great, you could probably look at NEI.org and, and uh, see this ad that they put together about this new technology that's been developed. It's very clean and very safe and very high energy density and all these aspects. And at the end of the ad, it says, oh, by the way, it's nuclear power. It's kind of akin to the, the natural gas ad. And so we just need to have good, solid, you know, campaigns like that to bring out the, the benefits can, of this. Can I just follow up on that, yeah. then, Jeff? I mean, I agree with what you're saying, but there has to be real leadership in that, right? You need to have spokespeople who are well-spoken, not necessarily the nerds sitting in the back. So who's doing that? I mean, who in this country is standing up? I'm looking at Mark. Who in this country is standing up and, and taking a leadership role in that communications? Because it's not easy, and it's time-consuming, and it's very important. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I mean, ANS has a role. Uh, uh, but I would say what I'm seeing is it's beyond even NEI. You've got a set of think tanks and NGOs inside of DC that are now coming together to try to come up with the common messages. And in many cases, they're not what you would typically call the pro nuke crowd. They're coming in it from a different perspective. And I think they're going to be an important component to it. But I, I, I would actually argue that we have a role. Uh, and and I, I personally think I have a role. And, and we can question my effectiveness at it, but I think I have a role. So I, I, I work with with them to try to make sure that we're on a common, common set of messages because I think the labs are an important part of it because we bring, we bring technical objective credibility to, to it. Uh, but it, it, we do get too geeky sometimes. So, so how, how, do you, how do you talk about it? But the value proposition for nuclear never has been stronger. We just got to figure out how to talk about it, I would argue. Yeah, you know, I, and I agree, and I, I don't dismiss the importance of communication, but I, I'll be a little bit contrarian here in the sense that I, I don't think we should lose sight of the fact that there's an economic story here. And, and if gas was not $5 per million BTU and it was still 10 to $15 per million BTU, we'd be having a very different conversation right now. And, and I don't dismiss the importance of communication and, and continuing to educate the public about the effects or no effects of low-dose radiation and those things. But, but I think we have to be a little bit careful about making that the whole conversation. And uh, I think Tim Hanley from Exelon talked very well today about how important the communities view those reactors that they live around, right? And uh, because of the economic impacts, the, the great jobs that it provides. Um, and, then, and then to the point that Mark made earlier that you know, the, the early, young people see the environmental, well, not just young people, sensible people see the environmental benefits of nuclear. So, so I think we just have to be balanced about that uh, and not overdo the, 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 you know, the hyper concern about, about the, the kind of the classic nuclear fears, you know, so. Oh, sorry. Yeah. 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 And also, uh, to, to tell the reliability and resilience story, it was alluded to a little bit earlier, Tim brought up the DOE report it's not only how do you monetize it or value it and get in FERC and the, and the ISOs to do, do the right thing, but also how do you talk about it? Because right now it's, it's, the, it's, the, un, it's the unquantified benefit. How do you talk about that? To me, that, that's an important part of it too. And then, then you've got to put that into a very coherent 30 second elevator speech and it just took us five minutes to talk about it. So, so, so seriously, you need to come up with what is that succinct pitch that you, can, that you can tell, that you can put somebody like me up in front of a crowd and they go, wow, that, exactly. Right. So, 
Uh, one final note, just to highlight the importance of, of, of what you just said, creating the elevator pitch, highlighting the message, creating some cohesive, you know, consistent message among, among some of the industry people finding a leader. Those are all really great answers, but to highlight the importance of it, monetizing it, folks like, uh, <clears throat> I worked in industry as a consultant before I came here, in order to keep your expertise in the engineering and design and development of plants, people are going to other countries. Uh, Bill Gates, for example, has a Bill Gates fund and is funding, you know, the development of this technology in China. America is losing grip, I think, a little bit as a technological leader in this space for reasons like we, we can't get past the ability to start something new uh, and, and draw in, the, you know, the, the, the monetary dollars from organizations like this. So uh, that's as much as I wanted to add. Thank you for your answers. Very helpful. Hi, Paul Howes from the uh, UK. Uh, when we look at what we are celebrating here today and, and, and the picture on the screen behind really shows it's about a moment in time between people coming together with a facility and a, and a mission-driven program. And we're celebrating that moment in time that happened 75 years ago, which we look at today and say, well, thank God they actually did that because it's really helped to move the industry forward. If we just pick up on some of the points raised, if we look at the innovation development time horizon for nuclear, it's tending towards infinity. If we look at the resources required, it's tending towards infinity. If we look at the political time horizons, they're tending towards zero. And if we look at the internationalization, and the statement was on the screen earlier from President Trump that shows independence and many countries are tending towards an independent um, uh, energy policy and, and policies outright. If you put all that lot together, the climate isn't really looking very good for us. Is it a case that we need to now, picking up on Eric's point earlier, is there something that we need to do which is around focus and simplification? If we cast ourselves forward 75 years, what are they going to say, thank God they actually did that? What, what is it that we need to do now? Is it we're in, a, we're in a situation where we're doing a bit of a ten-fingered stab, we're moving forward on so many fronts, we are not actually focusing on how we're going to get this industry back up and on the rails? Welcome the uh, thoughts from the panel. Well, uh, I, yeah, yes, I, I agree with focus. Uh, I'll be specific, this is now US centric. To me, if we don't figure out how to protect the existing fleet, that a lot of this rest of this conversation doesn't matter a whole, doesn't matter to me. Um, and let's hope that Vogel 3 and 4 in Georgia actually happen because that's causing sort of a existential crisis, I'd say, in the US. Um, but from our perspective, getting new scales, SMR successful, has to happen. So I think there is focus. What are the things that have to happen? New scale has to be successful next. And so the labs are doing everything they can to help that be. But, but I think the opportunity that is the, advan is the beyond the new scale advanced reactor opportunity, is the, is it, that's, that's the moment. We've got to seize that moment, to me. And uh, if, 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 if I look back five years from now and we haven't moved that ball, then I'm going to be disappointed that I haven't done what I can do. Um, I, I, I know you, you painted a very uh, sort of glum picture, right? The candles almost flickered out, Paul. <laughs> I mean, uh, and and, and I, I guess I take, I, uh, eternal optimist, but I take what the president said and what I'm hearing from the secretary and what we've got in the labs and the universities and, and, the, and the reactor community in the U.S. is an opportunity. So we, be, we better take it. But it, if we don't do it now, I don't think it's going to come back. And then from the U.S. perspective, we lose leadership. So I think the urgency is not only climate, it's also U.S. leadership. So um, you just got to try to work it as hard as you can. I, you know, I don't, but a lot of things have to fall together, no doubt. So I, I would just comment on that because I think it's a great point. I mean, what we had at CP1, obviously, was urgency, right? There was one problem to solve. UK was in it like the US was in it. Uh, we also had some great science that had just happened, right? The chain reaction was critical, but before that it was the splitting. We heard that this morning, actually 
Steve mentioned it, the splitting of the atom and the fact that you could release a lot of energy. The question is, what's the urgency today? I mean, you do see this in other places, in other big science areas, right? So we talked about CP1 as being the birth of big science, but the ingredients were all there. There was the urgency, there was, you know, in particular the U.S., which was willing to spend an inordinate amount of money, and we actually had collected a lot of great minds, engineers and scientists from fascist Europe, right, which was all great, I guess. Uh, you know, what's the urgency in nuclear today? I mean, there are other examples. I mean, clearly in health, when you have cancer, you've got urgency. People, everyone feels that. The problem is what Jeff said. I mean, the, the price of gas is cheap, and so it's hard to find that urgent moment now for nuclear. I mean, there, there's clearly a need for it. What's, I guess what Mark mentioned, the environmental issues that people have mentioned, you know, how do you find zero carbon sources? But I think this is something that this community will continue to have to not fight, but think about, is what's the messaging What's the urgency? What's going to get people to commit? I mean, you can ask the same question of Korea. Why is Korea, Korea's doing it, right? You're just moving down the path. Part of the reason Korea's doing it is that's the only natural source of power. I mean, it's, Korea doesn't have natural gas, doesn't have, you know, lots of coal. And so uh, there's a clear security issue, I would guess, in Korea that's driving that. And there's a real urgency now more than ever, which we don't have to talk about. But uh, the question is, how do you create that urgency? Maybe you can't. Maybe you do have to plot it at some slower pace. It's a great question, but obviously CP1, it wasn't singular in history. There have been other events like that, but it was fairly unique. So we're here today talking about it, but it was a unique moment in history. Uh, and that's why health is a story that you can talk about. You can give the elevator pitch for why we're doing, you know, it, you know why we're doing genetic you know, engineering, why we're doing you know, immunology, why we're doing you know, even when you talk about allergies, people get it and they want to solve that problem because they have allergies. So it's an interesting problem that we face. Yeah, I mean, yeah. science in general faces this problem, but nuclear, you know, how, so if you have that, if you have that one, you know, that silver bullet for what is the urgent moment now, uh, it's, I'd love to hear it. Yeah, I, I, if you've got it, I'd, like, I'd love to hear it too. Uh, but but I, I would say that partnerships from the U.S. perspective, partnerships with the, U, with the U.K. and Canada are on my mind because I, I, I do think that we're in similar places. Uh, we think about it in a similar way. And so I, I think, you know, this isn't, to me, there's, there's those kinds of considerations as well. Of course, global partnerships are important. It's a global, this is a global thing, but that, that, that may help. Uh, but then, then you get into political time scales in three different countries, which makes it even harder. So, so to, to me, we need to just plow ahead and try our best to lay out for the policymakers what needs to be done, and hopefully the urgent decisions are made. All right, let's, let's do, you had, a, you had a question? Let's do one more question, and then we'll wrap up. Eric Lowen from North Carolina. The question is, do you see yourselves working on design tools in the future? So let me briefly explain. ESBWR has about a million requirements that flow down from a 7,000-page DCD, plus all the requirements that flow in. Um, and the detailed design that the NRC expects to see is pipe runs, cable trays, those sort of things, so it's tough. So if Jake had his detailed design done, because he doesn't like process, but he uses your tool, then he shows up at the NRC and they say, why not change this thing? Then he can hit the button on this design tool that says based on the PRA or reliability or security or OSHA requirements, that's a bad thing. Don't make us do that. And I can tell you now, the commercial tools that are available in the marketplace don't work under Appendix B quality assurance. So do you see yourselves, the three labs, doing anything on design tools? Uh, yeah, uh, you know, I, I don't know, Eric. I mean, uh, I, my my sort of gut response would be probably not. I mean, that doesn't sound like a national lab uh, activity. Now, you know, I'd look at some of my people that do advanced modeling and simulation and say, is that something you do? I, I kind of see a, uh, maybe, <laughs> you know. So, um, you know, I think, I think this is a challenge though, right, is where this goes back to this sort of discussion earlier about the innovation cycle and where do the handoff points happen and what's the role of the lab. So, um, yeah, I, you know, I, there could be, you know, things that make sense for a national lab to do in that. But, um, but again, I, to me, the, you know, the, you know my, the bigger question would be if there was a market there, there would be, probably be a commercial vendor that would step up and do something like that. 
One concrete thing that's going on is um, the GAIN folks have had a set of workshops on modeling and simulation. Uh, the, the, with NEI and EPRI and they've brought in a, uh, and they're doing a really good job of sort of surveying the code suite that's being developed at the laboratories in particular and how that fits into their needs. And so I'm sure they're having that conversation, I'm just not privy to it, about where that line gets drawn. So you might, if you're interested in it, check with Rita. She, she would have some good insight on that. So I, I've spent a fair amount of, uh, first of all, my name is Tom Fanning. I work in the nuclear engineering division. Uh, I manage the engineering analysis department, and I'm also a code manager for one of the pieces of software you might be interested in. And I've spent some time thinking about this, and it is a significant challenge. Uh, the, the codes and tools that are developed at the labs are primarily developed in an R&D environment, not the type of uh, NQA1 type of environment that you're talking about. And I, I do see a potential transition point where, uh, first of all, the, the labs do need to step up the game in terms of especially software quality assurance. But I don't see us going all the way to an NQA1 compliant type of environment. But we need to get much further than we currently are. And then at that point, there has to be engagement with industry, so with GE, with Oak Low, with Westinghouse, with whoever. Uh, to do some sort of commercial grade dedication process or something to make that transition to an environment where it's useful for you guys. Uh, we started the process with the code that I manage um, and, and so much of what you guys are discussing resonates very strongly with me. Uh, you know, the, the education, the uh, uh, industry-led initiatives and all this other stuff. But but to be blunt, the, the funding that we had this year to start that QA process has now been redirected to industry initiatives. So now it's gone. So, uh, you know, I, I support the industry initiatives, but I want to make sure that we're also sustaining the national laboratories and the basic core functions that we need to operate under as well. And uh, so, so, but but that's that's where I see the bridge happening is we need to step up our game on, on the SQA side because I promise you it's not being done as well as it needs to be done. Um, but, I, but at some point there has to be a transition. We, we are not, I don't think, in a position to go all the way to NQA1 with our codes. That's something that I think industry would need to step up and, and make that transition happen. Thank you. I don't know if that helps. Okay, let's, let's um, thanks very much for the questions, excellent. So I think we're gonna wrap up now. And by way of wrapping up, I'm gonna ask each of the panel members to make any comment they want. They've got two minutes each so we can finish on time. Uh, just a comment on this discussion here or anything you heard during the day that you want to say, Ray? I, I guess one thing I wanted to mention in closing that, that we've, we've talked about and, uh, somewhat uh, throughout the day is, uh, you know, I, I think from, from a, a DOE perspective, and, and the labs play a big part in this, is, is U.S. leadership in nuclear technology. That's to, to, to influence the world, you, you need to have leadership in in the technology and, and that, that ties into national security issues as well. And so part of, part of what we're, we're, we push, I think, in DOE in, in, in the nuclear area now and, and in the future is to regain that leadership. And so we do have that, uh, that influence uh, with, the, with the rest of the world. So one thing I wanted to come back to is, is a graphic that Tim put up this morning where he showed us standing at a crossroads and when I thought about that I think you know what I think we're actually standing at a cliff and we see we see it's probably many of you have seen the, the so-called nuclear cliff graph where all the current fleet goes away very rapidly we're there uh, at that cliff what are we going to do are we going to continue to be in this game is a fundamental question for this country, certainly. And of course, I'm an advocate that we need to be. We have to sustain the current fleet. We have to evolve into the deployment of light water or, or uh, advanced reactors. And certainly there are many challenges with that. But I wanted to circle back to one thing. I love this picture. I assume the one I'm looking at is over my head here of looking at CP1 with the first criticality. And I really like going back, especially when you look at the Manhattan Project, to see what these people accomplished with the resources that they had. 
And it's just a very basic reminder for us of what can be accomplished and that we have resources available to us today and that we have the ability to overcome these challenges. Great. Uh, uh, yeah, I, you know, since I was part of the organizing team for Argonne, I, I think what I'd like to just do is, is thank all of our guests and the folks that have come to and made presentations today and, and people that have come and listened. This has just been a great, great event. It's been really exciting to see see folks come together from the, you know, from, from the sort of the startup industry, from the international community, from the current industry, from the, from the R&D, from our academic uh, components. And, uh, and, you know, we just have to continue these conversations. As Mark said, we were, th the three of us were at a Aspen event a few weeks ago having the same conversation. Um, of course, you know, we can't just talk amongst ourselves. We've got to get out there as well, too, and get that message out. And, um, but I want to thank everybody again. This has been a real honor for, for to be involved with this and, uh, and, and, and speaking for all of Argonne. Thank you for, for, for uh, coming and attending. So I'm standing between us and alcohol, right? Yeah, yeah. For those of us who drink. Uh, so, so I guess I'll just leave you briefly with a hopeful message. Um, the labs are up here. We work together. The lab, laboratory system in the United States is the best in the world. If we work together, and we are, with DOE, we can actually be an important part of the foundation that will allow nuclear to be part of not only domestic, but a gl the global energy supply go forward. So there's a lot of reasons why it's hard and a lot of obstacles that we face. But to me, we are in a, we're, we're, maybe it's a cliff, it's certainly a tipping point, that's for sure. And I'd prefer not to jump off the cliff. I'd prefer to, prefer to take the, take the somewhat risky way down and, and move quickly. Um, but I, I, th I think it, we're in an echo chamber here, as you just said, right? We're talking to ourselves here. Um, but, you know, I, I think there's a recognition amongst policymakers that this is an important sector that has to be protected and the president's words revived. So let's take the opportunity. Let's, let's not sit here and worry about how all the things that are wrong, let's go out and do it. And I, and I think the labs are prepared to go do that. And so it may not be CP1, Manhattan Project scale, but I think we need to start to go attack this problem and start to really go after it. Not worry about, oh, the money's getting moved here, here, here. Let's go attack the problem. Okay? Thanks, Mark. Why don't we thank our panel members for a very interesting conversation. I also want to thank uh, Linda Young. Did, have you raised your hand? You've done a great job in organizing. Yeah. <laughs> And, uh, and, and, and Paul for letting us use your lab and thanks to everybody for the, uh, a great day. Uh, and as Mark said, I believe there are refreshments downstairs. So thanks for coming.